It's bordered by the Wabash and Ohio on the one side this land is, by the Mississippi on the other. Its southern terminus is Cairo, where the two great rivers collide to continue their journey southward. Between the rivers, the earth rises to form farms of grain and fruit. Limestone bluffs and forest-covered hills. In the floodplain lie marshy swamps and their inhabitants. To the north are its arteries of oil, and beneath its surface are the rich deposits of coal. Upon its face, men are born, experience joy, no disappointment. In its marrow, they are buried. Egypt, the natives call this land. It is Illinois, and yet it's something else. It's Southern Illinois. At least 12,000 years, men have lived on this land. Paleo man was here, possibly following the mammoth or prehistoric bison through its valleys. The centuries of the archaic Indians saw the climate of the land change from cold to temperate, returning to cold once again. They consolidated into small migratory groups following the harvest of nuts and berries, of deer and of small game. During the era of the woodland people, the climate became stable. The soil received the blunted blade of a stone hoe, and the harvest was stored in pots of clay. In this period, the Hopewellian society prospered with its class distinction and religious hierarchy. Trade and commerce were introduced, conch shells from the Gulf and necklaces from the sea, copper from the north. From the woodland emerged the Mississippian culture and the land witnessed urbanization. Life was relatively affluent. There was time for religion, and art. Man began writing about this land. The sons of the Mississippians became the Algonquins, the grandsons, the Illini. And from the Illinois nation came the tribes of the Cahokia and Kaskaskia, the Tamaroa, Peoria, the Michigamis, and the Moinwina. For 120 centuries, it had been their land. But soon it was to be theirs no more. The beautiful river, the Wabwadagu, was the Ohio. The father of waters was the Mississippi. These were the names Joliet and Marquette heard when they first traveled this land. Some French were beckoned to this land by its rich resources of fur and the fantasy of precious metals. Marquette, the Jesuit, came to Christianize the wilderness. In 1673, he and Joliet found their way to the Mississippi and were the first white men to explore its shores. I embarked with the Sir Jolier, who had been chosen to conduct this enterprise on the 13th of May, 1673. In our two bark canoes, we stored a little Indian corn and some smoked meat, which was our entire food supply. One day, we encountered monstrous fish. They would strike the canoe with such force 
that we first took them to be submerged trees which threatened to upset us. Early in June, we came to the camp of the Miami on the Fox River. The Indians were friendly toward us and held us in respect. We told them of our mission. They warned that the Great River was very dangerous, harboring frightful monsters and bands of warring Indians. The next day we took our leave, and after a voyage of 40 leagues, we arrived at the mouth of our river. Finding ourselves at 42 and a half degrees latitude, we entered into the Mississippi with a joy I cannot express. As we moved southward, we left the beautiful prairie and entered the land of tall bluffs rising from the water's edge. Some of these bluffs, we saw veins of iron, some of which appeared to be a foot thick. We came to a junction with another river, the Wabustigu. There we met the roaring demon about which the Indian had warned us. It was the Ohio, spilling its swirling waters between rocks 20 feet high into the Mississippi. It was the French who first explored this land, and it was the French who first settled upon it. Fur trappers and missionaries, farmers and merchants. They settled mostly in a rich valley they called the American Bottoms. Kaskaskia and Cahokia were their first communities. But the possession of the territory was disputed, and in 1763, the land was ceded to the British. But soon, Britain had another conflict to deal with, the American Revolution. During the first years of the Revolution, warring Indians attacked American settlements in the Northwest Territory, while the scalps were bought by the British. It was a native of Virginia and pioneer in Kentucky, George Rogers Clark, who was appointed by Governor Patrick Henry to stop the marauding and secure the Illinois country for Virginia and for the cause of the revolution. Clark raised a small army of 150 men, woodsmen and pioneers mostly. They gathered their forces on a small island near the falls of the Ohio, Louisville. On the 26th of June, 1778, we set off from the falls, double manned our oars and proceeded day and night to avoid the disclosure of our mission. On the eve of the fourth day, we arrived at the Tennessee. I ran my boats into a small creek about one mile from Old Fort Massac. The next day, we started our overland march to Fort Kaskaskia. Our route northwest was a very fatiguing one for about 50 miles until we came to the level plains. I feared our secrecy would be jeopardized by the openness of these meadows and where every nation of Indians could raise an army three or four times our number. On the evening of July 4th, we reached the town of Kaskaskia. After night fell, we quickly surrounded the area, employing great silence. I took part of my little army and broke into the fort. Hello. 
Within 15 minutes, it was secured. The Revolutionary War at last was over. Time rounded a bend and started down a new century. Pioneers began to move down new rivers. The Allegheny and Cumberland. The Wabash, Ohio and Tennessee. They came in boats of every description. Rafts, dugouts, keelboats and flatboats. Animals and people embarked together floated down the river, sharing the same plank of wood, looking for a new home. It was a new era. The war had been won, and now the West was theirs for the taking. They came from Virginia and Pennsylvania, the Carolinas and Tennessee. They were Scottish, Irish, Dutch, and English, and they brought their customs with them. They settled, many did, in the delta of the Illinois country, between the two great rivers. They cleared the land and made homes, planted crops and started commerce. Down the Ohio from Pittsburgh came their supplies. Down the Mississippi to New Orleans went their produce. Another Egypt, they said it was, for in the year of the deep snow, 1831, the crops of the north were shortened by the abnormal cold. Farmers traveled south to buy the surplus grain of the delta for their livestock. Going down to Egypt for corn, they said. And the wagons rolled by. Farming today is a, a business just like anything else, and it's a, a big business. Uh, Barb and I farm approximately 600 acres of land. Most of this operation is farmed uh, by ourselves, with the exception of maybe a little outside help during the harvest season and the planting season. You'll start in at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you'll wind up at uh, 9 and 10 of the night a lot of the time when you're planting corn, you know, same way with harvesting. My father and grandfather used to think that they had a good day's work in if they shucked a 75 bushel of corn. Well, with this machine, you can uh, shell approximately 600 bushel an hour. That means that you can shell 40 to 60 acres a day and this, in their day, could be half or maybe all their entire crop, this acreage. And it used to take them two and three months to shuck it, whereas I can shell it in one day's time. Nowadays, it takes $75,000 to 100000 machinery inventory to farm 600 acres of land. In a normal year now, farmers would probably take in uh, farming 500 acres with cattle approximately uh, forty to fifty thousand dollars a year but then uh, our expenses are so much greater we wind up probably about the same as my grandfather made i've been on this old farm 65 years and it's been uphill and rocky a lot of times i'll tell you you talk about raise a family, I've been there. There was eight children, you might say, and uh, my mother and my mother-in-law was ten. Oh, there was no welfare. As the old saying is, I was a king bee. Why, killing six and eight hogs here wasn't nothing to me. Why, 300 old hens here, that, that didn't mean anything. We always had three to five good milk out, and we got back. Every fellow had a job, he knew what to do. I raised two boys. I told them one time what I wanted done. They went ahead and done it. They, they never said no. But ordinarily, I didn't say go on, boys. I said, boys, come on. The same way with the mule. There's too many people who can't get along with the mule. Why? 
The first thing I do, I learn them you to love me. First thing I do. I have owned mules and go on a cornfield. From the time I uh, started chucking corn, they just walked along with me. They kept me between the front wheel and the hind wheel all the time. Never say a word to them. They learn this. But you got to pet them. You got to be good to them to learn them. You can't abuse them and learn them that. When I went in the cornfield, they never heard me ever say a word to my team. However, I'll frankly admit that I've heard neighbors over in the far field hollering at their team when I could hear them very plain. Maybe his mule's name would be John. Well, John wouldn't stop or something. <laughs> he was on the contrary list that morning. And the neighbor I did him over there, he said, Well, John, John, I'll get around there back in, I'll unhire you. I think really and truly we had a better time back then than we do now. Why, well, people enjoyed life. They didn't have any money, but then they didn't need much money. Another thing at that time, if you needed a neighbor, you need to help, you need a friend, it was right at your door. And today, our neighbors are gone. All this heavy equipment in farming has drove a little one-horse farmer out, lived sold out, they've left here. And, uh, doggone it, uh, there's no one around here anymore. Well, there where I live, the first remember there was nine acres cleared on that 168. People that didn't farm in this part of the country then. They just have a little patch they hunted fish, trap, and they raised cattle and hogs. Now, you'd think they'd have to have some feed, but they didn't. You see these hills and valleys were just standing thick with the cod? Why, the hogs would run out in these bottoms and these hills and get just as fat as mud. I've known my dad to kill as many as 40 going to hog killing. And he'd, he'd cure the meat, all he had room for, make the sausage, then the next summer, he'd, he'd sell that meat. He'd take it to Charlottetown and sell it. He'd get, sometimes he'd get eight and ten cents a pound for it after it's cured. Two and a half cents right off of the pole. Oh, hog killing, I, I enjoyed the hog killing better than the county fair. The men go in the wood with the rifles and they'd shoot them down. And stick them and just go on. Well, there'd be a couple of men a following with a yoke oxen and a sled with a wagon bed on it. They'd toss them in there, they'd get a load. They had uh, platforms, barrels, set them on the stall them in. Well, maybe they'd have four or five of them. Well, there'd be two men to chug them up in the barrel, they'd throw them back, and be two or three men back there to take the hair off of them. That's the way it went. And the kids would come, and we'd blow up bladders, you know, and beat each other over the head. And you'd keep them while they'd get dry. We'd put corn or beans in there. I tied a hog bladder to a dog tail right where I live now one night. We didn't live there, but my uncle did. And we're thrashing wheat. This dog was a pup. He belonged to one of the neighbors. We had to sleep out on the porch, you know, and around. And that son of a gun just kept getting in the bed and kept getting in the bed. There was a hog bladder there. I don't know how old it was, but it was just dry as a cracker, you know, when I told him, by God, you hold him, I'll tie this to his tail, he'll leave here. <laughs> and you know, we heard of that dog. It caused a team to run away in Kentucky.
Shawneetown, raucous, rambunctious Shawneetown. In the first quarter of the 19th century, it was the metropolis of the Illinois Territory. A main port for flatboats and broadhorns. The center of trade and the den of iniquity. It was the financial center of Illinois during those early years. In the young state, currency was scarce, and the Shawnee State Bank was allowed to issue its own. And soon, counterfeiting was popular. As a source of financing for the new land, the bank made many decisions affecting the development of the area. As legend has it, one such decision was to turn down a loan requested for developing a little place called Chicago as being too damn far from Shawneetown to amount to anything. It was the river that made Shawneetown, and it was the rampaging river that caused its demise. It's a 900, but it's a damn good 900. Oh, I've, I've got some mad at them sometimes. And I've seen them float up the river. They'll absolutely sometimes do it, float upstream to shores of the world. I'd like to tell one, one old man, he's running the falls up here in Louisville, high water. Jail Sides was on the boat with him, chief. And Jail told me, he said, I'm going to bring a out. Said, the old man come down through that bridge. He throwed her hard down. She just kept running straight. Said the old man walked back and sat down and said, I got you gonna have to take her, Lord. I've done all I can do. The old said he sat back there with me and said directly she started coming up. Finally she come around, straightened up, and he got up and said, Thank you, Lord, I can handle her now. The old said, You don't do that now in bed, do you, old man? He said, Yeah. I ain't going to bed no more. This Ohio River moves a hundred million tons of cargo. Goes up and down this Ohio River. Of course it is. You got the power here, and then you've got that weight. See, we've got about 23,000 tons. And there's something else. Uh, uh, today, people are hit with so many big numbers, millions, billions, and they don't ring a bell. But uh, when you figure a trailer truck's got 20 tons, well, you figure each one of those, each one of those boxes out there has got roughly 100 trailer truck loads in one barge. So you get that way, even though the weight isn't moving but eight or nine mile an hour, if it stops suddenly, it's going to crumble that steel. It's got to. It just, you just can't do it. It was still a long way from the civilization of Philadelphia or the plantations of Virginia this land was. It required a hardy and rough-hewn man to settle on it or to ride its rivers. Men who worked hard and played hard. Men like Mike Fink. I'm a salt river roarer. I'm chuck full of fight and love the women. He was king of the keelboaters and typical of the brawn, skill, and daring that came west to the delta of Illinois. Such a character was necessary, for there were those scavengers who fed on weakness. Ford's Ferry Road has many tales of robbery and murder while the stronghold of river pirates was Cave in Rock. Well, I 
How's she going? Oh, pretty good, I guess. Uh, thing seems to be. What the hell do we have for lunch? That barbecued chicken and mashed potatoes, baked beans, and good old homemade light bread. Good dinner, good dinner. How about getting me a cup of coffee? About a half I half think half. I'll get myself one also. Pretty close. You love a rub there. Yeah, and he also told me that red turning buoy's missing down here at Walker's bar. Yeah, well, I come down there one time, that buoy was gone. There wasn't no buoys then, anyhow. Steamboat. I got out there too wide and hit that thing. Stayed there for quite a while. father had license from Saberton, Missouri to Memphis, Tennessee, and they called him a long trade man. Now, if you don't have license all over the United States and biggest part of Arkansas, you ain't got any at all. They used to say back in the old packet boat day, they had wooden boats and iron men. They carried a pretty good sized crew on them boats. They had a roof captain. They didn't do anything but be captain of the boat. Had a pilot on each watch. They had a mate, first clerk, second clerk, and then they had one they called a mud clerk. He uh, did all the checking of the freight on the bank. And the reason they called him a mud clerk, uh, he had to go out on the bank, and his feet was always muddy when he'd come aboard the boat. And uh, so they nicknamed him the mud clerk. Most all the towns up and down the river at that time got all their supplies for water, you know. Well, that's why the packet boat was so great in its days. And, of course, they carried an awful lot of people on those boats. I've seen as many as 150 passengers on it, one on one boat. And, of course, they had to have a good cookhouse. They had cooks and waiters. And they set a beautiful, I'm proud of this, their dining room tables was all in white. And they all had pretty stem glasses on them and white cloth napkins. And it looked just like in some of the finest hotels today to look down through that dining room. Well, you just never saw anything any beautifuler in your life. And, and I mean it, you never. You know, it's just perfect. It was the era of the steamboat now. At first, the keelboats competed on downstream traffic, but at last, they faded away. And so did the Mike Finks. It was a new generation of commerce and travel. It was the era of the Captain Sellers and Mark Twain's. As Twain remarked, the boats tallied with the citizen's dream of what magnificence was and satisfied it. The packets roamed the river. Past the sleepy little communities of Elizabethtown, where the Rose Hotel has lodged guests since it was built in 1812. past Rosa Claire, where the lavender crystals of Fluorospar are mined. By Golconda, where Sarah Lusk operated the ferry which transported settlers from Kentucky to Illinois. And where, in 1838 to 39, some 15,000 Cherokee Indian refugees passed along their Trail of Tears. WX-5399, the city of St. Louis, Lock 51. 
Uh, the city of St. Louis back. Uh, what do you have up there around the lock? Yeah, the lock's all clear, Chris. Now, give me your uh, number one is what you have in tow. Uh, the city of St. Louis back. I have 15 loads, 1,165 foot long, 105 foot wide, 26,000 tons of alumini. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, you all come right on down then. Uh, thank you very much. And the city of St. Louis clear. How's her headway look? Okay, I'm all stopped. Is her stern off too far, you think? Five foot all the way back. Five foot all the way back. I'm all stopped and floating. Don't forget you ain't got five foot clearance. I'm going to put a little twist in her, Gary. Look like she's trying to crawl out back here. She's got something in the wheel, ain't she? I'm still floating. She's still wanting to crawl. I'm coming to edge slope. I tell you, some of these tricks they pull on guys on these boats. And new men, especially, you know, a green man, oh. I was on the Twin Cities, and the pilot, and the, they said, have a fit out there at that new boy. So I got me some toothpaste and got her lathered up pretty good, you know. And we got down in that log pit, and boy, I just had a terrible fit. This scared that boy to death. So we come back to the boat, and they told that boy, I said, if he has another one of them fits when you go to bed, said, just take your coffee can full of ice water and throw on him. Said, that'll cure him. Well, they didn't tell me that, see. So they said, have another fit. So me and that boy went in that room, and boy, I started having another fit, and he wheeled that coffee can of ice water out, and it will cure a fit. Down around the big toe of Illinois descends the Ohio, joining forces with the Cumberland and Tennessee. Now moving northwestward, it passes Paducah and Brookport, Old Fort Massac and Metropolis. Over and through lock and dam, 52 and 53 it flows. And turns south again, as it slips along parallel to its mate, the Mississippi. Then there is that last point of land before the river's junction. Cairo, the tip of the delta. It was looked upon as the site for a great inland seaport by some. But not by Charles Dickens, who traveled past Cairo in 1842. At length, on the third day, we arrived at a spot so much more desolate than any we had yet beheld, that the forlornest places we had passed were, by comparison, full of interest. A place without one single quality to commend it, such as this dismal Cairo. But Cairo withstood the disease and heat and the wrath of Mr. Dickens. Across the midsection of the 19th century, it was a bustling river port, where a hundred river boats docked a day. When Civil War came, Southern Illinoisans were divided. Many of their roots were in the South. Some had owned slaves. But in the shadow of war, most rallied behind Lincoln, and the Delta pledged itself to the North. Cairo became a center of military activity for the Union. 
By September of 1861, the garrison was under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant, and he succeeded in controlling the rivers. Suddenly, the city was a flourishing cotton market and a port of trade. The shipyard ways slipped boat after boat into the Ohio. The packets shared the channel with gunboats. South went the mechanisms of war. From the South came its byproduct, Union and Confederate alike, to be buried in the National Cemetery at Mound City. The killing ended. The false economy of the war collapsed. Life in Southern Illinois sought a new equilibrium, never to be quite the same. But the old Mississippi was still there, still flowing with the memories of Twain, Flint, Marriott, Dickens, and all those others that moved along or lived beside the meandering current. They talk about how the Ohio water don't like to mix with Mississippi water. Why, sometimes you can see a band of clear water running along the east side of the Mississippi for a hundred miles or more. I hate this river, and as I look down upon its wild and filthy waters, boiling and eddying, I cannot help feeling a disgust at the idea of perishing in such a vile sewer. Dear me, what a sip of water. It's been standing too long. I like it right thick with that sweet clay taste. Here, Juno, get me some water fresh out of the river with that true Mississippi relish. The child of calamity said that was so. He said there was nutritiousness in the mud. And a man that drunk Mississippi water could grow corn in his stomach if he wanted to. But what words shall describe the Mississippi, great father of waters, who, praise be to heaven, there's no children like him, an enormous ditch running liquid mud six miles an hour. The great Mississippi, the majestic, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tongue, shining in the sun, the dense forest away on the other side, yeah, this old Mississippi really moves around a lot. It uh, cuts off one place and deposits another and builds up another place. And, oh, large farms, six, seven, eight hundred acres caved in the river and then give another guy another farm of three or four hundred acres on the other side of the river. See, a lot of these farmers back in them days, too, you see, that's why a packet boat didn't go so fast. A lot of times you wouldn't go over three or four miles till you'd land at a farm and uh, pick up some livestock, especially in thrashing season. Packet boats had no really certain place to land, only at towns. They had certain places at town. It was nothing to stop at a little town like Thebes. Boat lay there three or four hours unloading groceries and furniture and all kind of commodities. It was a pretty prosperous little town when the boats landed there. They did quite a bit of business out of Thebes because those farmers back out in there, that's the only way they had to get anything to town. It was once a steamboat town and a railroad town and a prosperous town. It was a proud day in 1905 when the new railroad bridge across the Mississippi was finished. But then the shiny steel began to tarnish. The steel plow and McCormick Reaper had opened the fertile plains to the north. The agricultural markets and the industries of steel and the transcontinental railroads had gone north. Southern Illinois began to rust. But there was still the good earth, and beneath its surface, 
coal. Coalfields used to have a name for being rough, but I think most strip miners today have a high school education. We have some boys out there that uh, have some college. I don't think you could put a brand on a coal miner as being different than anyone else. In fact, a deep mine uh, miner doesn't consider us fellows that work at strip mines coal miners at all. We're a different breed, I guess you'd say. It's the largest shovel in existence. It has the largest bucket. The weight of the shovel is something like 29 million pounds. I think it has something like between two and three million pounds of scrap iron in the back, ballast. That's to offset the weight of the bucket loaded. There's a 180 cubic yard dipper. Each crawler weighs 400 ton and it has eight crawlers. Eight hoist motors, 2,000 horsepower apiece, which would give you 16,000 horsepower, which pulls your bucket up through the bank. Has four hoist cables, three and a half inches in diameter. We even have computers on it. the procedure for operating a strip mine, anything above the coal, which has rock in it, it has to be drilled and shot. If you can't get the overburden prepared to where you can dig it with the shovel, you're out of business. You just don't ever get there. First thing you do is you dig a trench down to the coal, make a box cut. In other words, this is the first cut when you get to the opposite end from the one you started at. Well, they load the coal out behind you and you turn the machine around and you start back. Now at Captain, they have bulldozers that knock the top of the spoil down and level it off and they seed this with various type grasses. And eventually, they will grave cattle or some mines uh, have orchards on these little strip hills. Then the coal loading shovel loads the coal out. into trucks and the trucks take it up to the hopper, dump it in the hopper and it goes up through the preparation plant by means of a belt or belt. And through uh, various stages up there, it comes out in different sizes and some of it's washed and some of it isn't, depending on the, the customer's requirements. And it's loaded into trains automatically. 20 years ago, I'd say that a good mine produced maybe a million ton a year. Now, last year at Captain, we produced 5,800,000 and some thousand ton. About 1900, I was 14 years old when I started the mine. I was born in 88. When I started in, our scale was 236. And then we moved from there. 256 was a top scale. Then we've moved on up. 272, five dollars and seven and a half. And uh, I don't know what the minimum scale is today, but it's somewhere around 
$25 a day, that's just roughly speaking. But the history of the coal industry, we went from where we started, five tons to the man on the payroll. We moved up to 10 tons to the man on the payroll. And then today, we run anywhere from 25 to 50 tons to the man on the payroll. breaking this mule, and he was a good-looking mule, but he was a mean mule. He wouldn't break out. And Jack and Chick was there, and Fred told them, well, we both told them the mule wouldn't break out. And Ed Melbourne, he said, yeah, that mule would break out. That was a good mule. So Jack, he sent him down with us on the Sunday. And, uh, Chick, he told us, he said, now, boys, that mule don't want to work. I said, he won't. So that night, I cut a shoe hook and straightened it and filed it out sharp. <laughs> had Fred on one side and me on the other. I was on the left side of the mule. And uh, Ed, he was in the car, and when he'd start to get over the front end, well, I'd gig this mule with that shoe hook. Boys, he'd really play a tune on the front <laughs> of the car. <laughs> that, that reminds me of, uh, in breaking a new mule, we'd let them make one trip, pull one car, while the regular mule driver pulled two. Oh, yeah. He'd rest one yeah. trip. So John Harris was working for me, and he had this mule in pretty good shape. I went up and said, John, he said, how about that mule now? Is he able to go? John says, Ben, I think he can keep up with the rest of them, but I don't know about poor old John. <laughs> <laughs> I started in as what's called a trapper. That opens doors for mules. But keep them from running together and having an accident, you flagged one and highballed the other ones. Me and Jack Reynolds went to work at Peabody 3, and my brother went over to 2. He could get an hour or two more on the day for driving this team, see? And money's what we was down here after, of course. Back in the 20s, you worked all winter to pay off what your debts was for the summer, see? And then working a day or two a week wouldn't keep you, so you run credit or borrowed money, or that's the majority of people. I was poor, and it makes you a good worker. But the reason I was a coal miner, the difference in the pay is what drove me to it. I remember one evening, and I had seven or eight drivers coming out of the north, and they were all out but one. And uh, I heard uh, the mule coming, the chains were rattling, and I think, well, he's kicked loose. But uh, the driver's right behind him, and he said, well, he said, you got a carload of men killed down there. I said, killed? He said, yes. Well, I said, they're not all killed, are they? He said, yeah, they're all killed. Well, I said, you stop here and let your mule go on. You stop here and flag those drivers and get some men down there to help get them out. And I said, uh, driver, you tell him as soon as these drivers get out to send all the motors in and stretchers and so forth. I got down there at about 500 feet of where they were at, and I heard them hollering. Well, I think they're not all dead. They're some alive. Got down there, and, and one fella, I thought he was killed. I was putting a, a jumper under his head and uh, lifted his head up, and I looked there in my hand. And I thought, what in the hell is that? And I saw his top of his head, and I just slapped it back up there. It had scalped him right like that. His laser back. His hard lingo. I don't really know. I don't think I did. Well, <clears throat> Another old fellow over there, he was an Italian, and he kept a hollering, he's a dying, he's a dying, and, and uh, working his head. Well, I said, hell, you're not a dying. He said, don't you think I am? I said, no. Well, he said, my neck's broke. Well, I said, your neck's not broke. I said, you couldn't be working your head like that. Well, he said, if my neck's not broke, he said, my legs are in a hell of a shape. <laughs> <laughs> 
come to find out one of them broke in three places, the other one in two. Back in the old days, they wasn't working this gassy section then, in the old days. Your danger was falling roof, and you didn't have many hospitals. And the coal miners, I said, they're out in the field, they're not on town. And if a man got hurt, well, you throwed some straw in the wagon and put him in and covered him up with some blankets and took him home. If he lived, he lived. If he died, he died. That's the way we lived then. Today, if a man gets hurt now, they know what to do with him. And, and they're good. Those teams, those, those teams are good. Bill, you remember back in the old days when we had no wash houses, a few of us would go in and build us a little shack out there, the stove in the middle, and we had a wash tub. Oh, two yeah. Of, two of us washing the tub, and we always hurried to see who could get in first because he got the cleanest water. The man got in second, got the dirty water. Yeah. Where did you get your hot water at that time? We went to the barter room and turned steam in cold water <laughs> to heat it up with. That, that's the reason why I asked you that, because I was the one making that steam. That meant more fire. Back in them times, too, uh, they didn't waste much water on their back. A lot of them had the idea that washing their back would uh, uh, lose their strength in their back. Yeah, I remember that. We were straggling monkeys, operators were. They were trying to make a living. And if anything got too bad, they just had to walk off and leave it. Now, this mine I had at Johnson City during the war, there was 80 Austrians worked there, and there was never 80 better workers ever went in the coal mine. They wanted to make money, and they made it. There was workers. Mostly Italians and Austrians. And there was quite a few colored people working the coal mines. And uh, uh, we had an awful lot of Englishmen come over here. The ones who's going into the coal industry now has got a good future in front of them. It's good money, and it's not hard work. It's not that old muscle work, pick and shovel and sledge and wedge. Today, with our modern equipment, with 8,000 coal miners in the state of Illinois, as we did 50 years ago, 60 or 80,000 miners. Well, back then, the uh, hand loading days, been probably uh, four or five tons per man, the average. Yeah. Today, it's 40 or 50 tons. That's, that's your difference. Well, that's and, the difference there. And now, I would say that the coal industry is in the best condition that's ever been in. That's due to our power plants. That's right. Where they are selling their coal. And I'd say at the economy in southern Illinois, is as good now as it's ever been. Yes, because any man, able-bodied man today, if he wants a job, he can get a job. I just wonder why everybody's in a hurry. Where are they going? What are they going to do when they get there? It seemed like that good old uh, friendship has been lost. I don't know whether they'll ever find it anymore or not. I think what we need is somebody that can help get some industry in there, that'll give people a job. If you can get something in there that'll it'll give people a job, why, well, you don't have to worry. It'll build itself. The old say it is, you know, even the little former boy told a story about the pays to advertise. Well, the younger generation is coming on, and they are better informed, better educated. They have new ideas, new ways of thinking. And uh, in 10 years from now, I, I truly believe that Southern Illinois will be much brighter. It served many generations, this land has. At times, it shows its fatigue. But it rises responding to a morning sun, eagerly looking toward the new day. A day which will allow progress without destroying tradition, accomplish prosperity without sacrificing values, and expand the society without depreciating the individual. 
This is Southern Illinois, a land, a people, a philosophy.